How do you know which supplements have proven benefits and are worth taking versus other supplements which are a complete waste of money and possibly harmful to our health, especially when supplement companies partner with scientists from highly respected institutions such as Stanford and Harvard who provide convincing arguments to take a particular supplement? In this video, I'll show you an easy step-by-step -step system to figure out if a supplement is worth taking, what popular supplements lack high-quality evidence and at this stage are a waste of money, and instead go through three supplements with great evidence of benefit for muscle performance, memory, and sleep respectively. This easy step-by-step -step system will save you a lot of money on supplements and help you focus on the ones that work. Step 1. Whenever a supplement company tries to sell you a supplement, look at the research they cite. But how do you know the difference between strong versus weak research? Because many supplement companies and influencers provide extremely weak research when you look into the studies they cite. They will often extrapolate research from single cells in a petri dish or from mice or if they do cite human research, that research will often be a case report of one person or an observational study. Instead, claims about a supplement must be backed up by human randomized controlled trials in published journals. You'd be amazed at how many popular supplements fail at this first hurdle, and I'm going to give you an example shortly. But first, what is a randomized controlled trial? This is where one group of people take the supplement and the other group takes a pill or a dummy medication. But here's where the magic happens. The people in the study don't know if the pill that they are taking is the real supplement or the dummy pill. They are blinded. And the people running the study also don't know who is taking what. They are also blinded. And this is where the phrase a double blinded trial comes from. The master list of who is taking what is sealed away until the end of the study and then the data is analyzed. That data then needs to be published in a peer-reviewed clinical journal. For anyone trying to sell you a supplement, you have to make sure that on their website or marketing material, they link to these randomized controlled trials. So let me give you an example. There's an incredibly popular supplement that's heavily marketed by a company in the longevity space. It's supposed to promote DNA repair, protect telomeres, support genomic stability, and reduce inflammation. But when you go onto the sales page, there are three references. The first is a study in genetically altered mice. So not even mice that have been given the supplement, but are genetically altered to increase levels of a certain enzyme. The next reference is a blog post, and the final reference is a review article of single cell and mice research, as well as some observations of human biology. There's not a single human randomized controlled trial of giving the supplement, yet it's incredibly popular. The supplement I'm referring to here are Sirtuin-6 or CERT-6 activators. Now, to be clear, I support further research on the supplement, but given that we don't have any human randomized controlled trials of CERT-6 activator supplements, I certainly wouldn't spend my money on it. We don't know if they're safe or effective. The second step into figuring out if a supplement is worth taking or not is to make sure that the human randomized controlled trial is focusing on functional outcomes. Now, this is crucial because it can be incredibly easy to be led astray at this step. You'll often hear that a supplement is anti-inflammatory or a powerful antioxidant, but those are measurements done in a lab. Instead, we care about what the supplement will actually do for our health and performance. We care about functional outcomes, such as will the supplement help us walk faster? Can we lift heavier objects? Will it reduce our risks of a heart attack? Does it improve our memory? These are functional outcomes. So let me give you an example to drive this point home. Calcium alpha ketoglutarate is another incredibly popular supplement in the longevity space. In a human study, the headline result was that people who took AKG showed statistically significant average reductions in their biological age of approximately eight years. Now, this study would have failed the first hurdle because it's not a randomized controlled trial, but it does give a really good example of not focusing on functional outcomes. The results are from blood tests analyzed in a lab. We have no idea whether the supplement helps people walk as fast as their eight-year younger selves or enhance their strength or reduce heart attacks. So beware when you see headlines like this referencing blood tests. What matters are functional outcomes. Step three to avoid wasting your money on supplements that lack evidence of benefit is to make sure that the human randomized controlled trial with a functional outcome has enough people included in the trial over a long enough duration. For example, if a study only has 10 people in it, that's not enough to make any firm conclusions. Contrast that to a supplement that does have great evidence, which I'll talk about later in the video. The study references over 2,000 people over a three-year period. So how many people are needed in a trial and for how long? 
Well, for muscle performance studies, and I'm going to make some sweeping generalizations here, otherwise we're going to get bogged down in the statistics, we want the study to run for at least three to six months and involve at least 80 to 100 people before any firm conclusions can be made. That's the bare minimum. Step four, we want to be vigilant about trickery. Supplement companies will often pay to run clinical trials, which is great, but what's not great is if they influence how the scientists conduct the study or report the data. This gets into the weeds a bit, and without proper training about how to read clinical trials, it can be difficult to know if a supplement has meddled with the study or not. So if you've gone through the first three steps and everything is looking good for a supplement, and the supplement is not on my supplement list that I take, which is on my website, I've probably made a video about that supplement and have gone through the evidence, but if I haven't, please email me and I'll have a look. The sponsor of a study isn't the only trickery that we need to watch out for. We also need to look at statistical trickery, which again gets into the weeds. But I want to go through a recent example from a study published a couple of weeks ago about another popular supplement called nicotinamide riboside, because without checking the statistics, we can get tripped up. So if we go through our checklist, step one, this is a human randomized controlled trial published in a clinical journal. Step two, it's using functional outcomes, specifically how far a person can walk in six minutes. Step three, it included 90 people and the trial lasted for six months. And step four, the trial was funded by biotech companies and a food company, so it does have the potential for bias. The headline finding was that after six months of treatment for patients with peripheral artery disease, the group who took the nicotinamide riboside supplement could walk 17.6 meters further in the six-minute walking test compared to the placebo group. That was roughly a 5% difference, which sounds great, but with a small percentage change, how do we know whether that difference is real compared to luck or chance? And this is where a concept called statistical significance comes in. Now bear with me because this is crucial. In clinical medicine, we typically use a 95% confidence interval. This means that if the result is statistically significant, we're 95% confident that the observed effect is real and not due to common chance. But in this study, they used a 90% confidence interval, which is less stringent and not common practice. So in this example, if we held the paper up to proper standards and used the 95% confidence interval, the headline result would not be statistically significant, and therefore we're not sure if this result is real or due to chance, particularly because other measures of muscle performance in the study failed to show an improvement. Specifically, there was no improvement in the degree of difficulty when walking, the stair climbing score, the SF36 functional questionnaire score, the gastrocnemius muscle biopsies of NAD, or overall physical activity compared to the placebo. Now, that gets into the weeds, but it's important because when looking at the study, I don't find it particularly convincing, and I'm not about to start recommending nicotinamide riboside supplements to my patients with peripheral artery disease, especially when we consider the fifth and final step to evaluate a supplement. Is it safe? And what do other studies of the supplement say? Taking nicotinamide riboside as an example again, it's a form of vitamin B3, and higher doses of another form of vitamin B3, called niacin, are associated with a 10% increased risk of death. And other studies suggest that nicotinamide riboside is converted to niacin by the gut bacteria before it's absorbed. So given that there are uncertain benefits of nicotinamide riboside, and other studies of vitamin B3 suggest that megadosing vitamin B3 might not be a good idea in the long term, I personally don't supplement with it. On the other hand, creatine supplements meet all five criteria for a supplement that's worth taking. But now, how do you select a brand? Well, the brand should have its supplements manufactured in a GMP and FDA certified facility. Testing certificates should be provided to ensure purity and that contaminants such as bacteria and heavy metals are well within safety margins. If the brand doesn't provide those certificates or information, you can check websites such as consumerlab.com or labdoor.com who test various brands and publish the results. Now at the start of the video, I said that I'd mention three supplements that have got strong evidence of benefit and I've already listed creatine. The second of three supplements are multivitamin and mineral supplements. A massive study in 2022, for example, called the Cosmos Mind Study, was published. It involved over 2,000 people, and that study ran for three years. It showed that daily multivitamin and mineral supplements, relative to placebo, resulted in a statistically significant benefit on global cognition. 
Another supplement to consider is omega-3, but there were some worrying headlines recently about omega-3, and I discussed those concerns and the omega-3 research in the next video here, and a massive thank you to all of the patrons supporting the channel.